Thank you very much for attending this webinar. We are going to talk about the Article 29 and how to enter it with Carbon for Finance. I'm today with Nolwenn Kazum, Head of Relationship Management, and I'm myself Head of Sales at Carbon for Finance. To begin with, I will propose a first presentation of Carbon for Finance, and then we'll deep dive into what is uh, the Article 29, and we'll specify how we can help you to answer it, detailing the different indicator expected and the link with our methodologies. And of course, we'll have time for the question at the end. So what is Carbon for Finance? Carbon for Finance is a climate and biodiversity data provider specialized in metric for the financial sector. We have been created in 2016, and we are more generally part of the group Carbon4. Carbon4 is a group with more than 16 years of experience in environmental modeling. It has been created by Jean-Marc Jancovici, a climate specialist, and by Alain Grandjean, an economist. At the time, in 2016, Euronex and Mirova asked for a specific solution for financial actors to have rigorous and transparent data to be able to answer their needs. Hence, Carbon for Finance was created with the, I would say, the rise of the first methodology and database called CIA for Carbon Impacts Analytics, which is our first database on transition risk for planets. In this database, we have directly the modeling of scope one, scope two, scope three, upstream and downstream for induced emission, but also for avoided emission. We'll talk about that as well, but we have also the modelization of temperature alignment at the portfolio level. Then we have developed a second database called CRIS to be able to assess physical risk for climate, and which is also useful for the Article 29. And more recently, two years ago, we have co-developed with CDC Biodiversity, the database called BIAGBS, to be able to measure the impact and dependencies regarding biodiversity. The specificity of Carbon for Finance is our bottom-up technology and methodologies. When you want to modelize generally, I would say, environmental data, you have two options, either to take economical um, standpoints and then modelize an environmental data, which is called more a top-down approach, either you come back from physical indicators and then you modelize an environmental indicator, which is called bottom-up approach. To take directly an example, when we want to modelize, for example, the scope one, the scope two, and the scope three for an automobile manufacturer such as Toyota, what we will do is that we will open the annual report and we will collect directly physical information, such as uh, the number of electric car, the number of hybrid car, the number of diesel car, and we'll apply specific emission factor for each type of cars to be able to remodelize the emission of scope one, scope two, and scope three. So if you have the same, for example, electric car, but sold in China or sold in France, we'll apply a different emission factor because we know that the energy mix is not the same in China and in France, it's more decarbonate. So what I've explained here is what we call the bottom-up approach. Here it seems to be quite maybe simple, but we apply that for 64 different sectors. And the point is that as we have this 16 years experience of carbon footprinting modeling, we have a huge internal library of emission factor, which is private and allow us to be able to remodel um, all the value chain for emission. And this is key, be it for climate or biodiversity, because what we know, and I'm sure if you are working in finance, you probably know as well, in annual reports, there is sometimes a lack of transparency or a lack of coherence between what is reported between one company and another. And when we look at the scope three specifically, it's usually um, not very good uh, modelized and hence it's very important to be able to remodelize when necessary the full value chain, be it for climate or for biodiversity. So if we go on the next slide, uh, what we are doing with our different type of clients, we are working directly for different type of clients such as asset manager, asset owners, uh, also banks, be it private bank or central banks. We are the official climate data provider for all the euro system, so for all European central banks uh, in Europe. 
but we are also working with index providers such as Euronext or SGX, or also as well with universities, or as well in terms of transparency with applications such as Rift or Goodvest. If we did dive more specifically uh, for biodiversity, uh, we help a lot of clients directly with our database and our platform, but also for transparency and for research. So for Article 29, uh, we help actors such as Rothschild Co, but also Malakoff Humanis to help them to report on Article 29 with our data. Article 29 is the first step, I will say, uh, on the way of the transparency. But when you have the different databases, you can also use it to create specific biodiversity or climate fund. You can use it to model your risk. Uh, you can use it for different type of uh, usage as well for engagement, which is described. We will see that in what is required for you to describe on your strategy regarding climate and biodiversity. In terms of coverage, we have the different type of uh, instruments. So we cover the listed corporates, sovereign bond, also green bond. We cover loans for banks, but also private equity, real estate, infrastructure, and directly corporate with the different type of solution within Carbon4 Group, but also with CDC biodiversity regarding private equity, real estate, and infrastructure. So we are able to cover, which is very important also for Article 29, a large part of your portfolio so that your Article 29 cover uh, your different risks and also all of your strategies. So if we go directly on the way we work and in terms of values, Carbon4 Finance has at its core in terms of value, the transparency and the scientific approach. And that is also a core value, I will say, of the regulation in Article 29. Article 29 requires you to be transparent in terms of the choice of the methodology, the choice of the metric, and the explanation of the different metric you have chosen within your report. This type of value for us is essential. Um, it's essential because it's um, what is necessary for clients to be able to take a strategy, but it's also our responsibility to be transparent in terms of the strength and limitation of the different methodologies. For the methodology we have created for climate, we have co-created them with uh, the help of Carbon4 Consulting and then 16 years experience in terms of climate modeling. And for the biodiversity database, so BA GBS, we are using the GBS model constructed by CDC Biodiversity, which also have 16 years of experience in biodiversity um, topic. So we are very proud to be, I will say, uh, have this long-term experience, but also this shared value in terms of transparency and open source. For example, this webinar will be as well accessible for um, everyone, including some, uh, I will say, competitors in YouTube directly, because we believe that it's important to share our knowledge on technical topic. So now, if we deep dive about what is Article 29, because it's the topic of the, uh, of the webinar of today. So directly, if we, we go back a little in time, we can see that everything might have begun in 2014 um, with the first non-financial reporting, European non-financial reporting. In France, in 2015, uh, we had the Article 173 of the Loi Energy Climat. We have begun to ask for different asset manager and asset owner to publish extra financial information. At the time, it was specifically on climate, which was already quite innovative in Europe, but globally, worldwide. Year after year, the, the treasurer and um, the government have looked at the different results and have learned also about what can be asked to different financial actors um, and how to use the different transparency and the reports that has been published. In 2019, it has been published the SFDR, so the Regulation on Transparency, but this time at the European level. And it was quite, I would say, good news for France because a lot of what has been done in Article 173 has been taken in SFDR regulation. At this time, it was also an opportunity for France to be able to review Article 173. And hence, they have decided to look at this article and look what can be approved. And what can be approved was in terms of the scope of the Article 173, 
but also in terms of the thematic. And they have introduced, so step by step, also the biodiversity uh, part, which is now required within the Article 29, which has inspired last year and helped also the development of TNFD, proving that in France already, financial actor has been able to publish metric on impact and on dependency directly about biodiversity. So if we deep dive on this topic on the next slide specifically, what we can see is that Article 29 is, I will say, the results of the history of a French mechanism. So it's what we have learned about Article 73. We have everything about Paris Agreement Alignment, Biodiversity Alignment. And what is very important is the fact that we will ask you to publish predefined targets on alignment with the Paris Agreement in terms of temperature objective. So that is important. We'll talk about that a bit later for the government as well to be able to see where the financial sector stands in terms of Paris Agreement. It goes beyond the European framework. We hope that the European framework will catch up. But for the moment, we can say that French uh, actors are quite innovative uh, because we already have biodiversity. And if we look back now with TNFZ, we can see and we help a lot of different French actors that they are in advance regarding their peers globally. And that's quite a competitive advantage for French actors to be able to have this, I will say, environment which have helped them to be aware, trained, um, develop, integrated in their system, all of the data on biodiversity as well. And last but not least, everything which is about transparency and reports, it's also, I will say, a, a journey because each year that different information are published, the question that is very important is how do we compare this different type of data? What can we do in terms of this data? And in France, we have the Climate Transparency Hub, which help all different actors to be able to learn from their peers as well from the different years of reporting. So now, if we look directly into what is required uh, by the Article 29, we look directly at the different paragraph. And my colleague, Norwen, will deep dive more specifically on the parts about the data. So the first paragraph is about general approach of the entity. Here, what we'll ask you is your investment policy and strategy, the list of sustainable products, and percentage of total assets, investor adherence to a chart, or maybe a label. If we look at the second paragraph, so internal means to contribute to the transition, the idea is to say that if you want to do anything, be it a project, launch a company, invest in low carbon products, what is important is to look at how much investment you are doing in terms to fulfill your ambition. And in, your, in our methodology, for example, in terms of a climate methodology, we look for each corporate in terms of a percentage of capex invested in low carbon projects. But here is the same is how much you as a financial institution have invested to contribute to the transition. So it can be financial, technical, human resources dedicated to ESG, internal capability building initiative, et cetera, et cetera. So then the, the third paragraph is about ESG governance within the entity. Same here, we can look at it in our rating about climate, but governance is as well key for the success of a project. Here, what we will ask is the knowledge, the skills and experience of the governance bodies, inclusion of ESG factor within remuneration policies, integration into internal board regulation, et cetera, et cetera. For your information, at Carbon4 Group and at Carbon4 Finance, we also do training for board and COMEX about these different topics about climate and biodiversity. So if within your strategy, there is a part about training, we can also help you at board level, but also for all of your different salaries with Carbon4 Academy. Then you have the different parts about engagement strategy, voting policy, and reporting. In France, we have a strong culture, I will say, about engagement. We have the example of self climate and all the work we can observe at the FIR as well. And here, what will be asked is your engagement strategy, voting policy, and your implementation records. So how much of your portfolio company is covered, 
the follow-up action, the legislation table and voted at the General Assembly, your investment decision taken regarding this different uh, decision, etc., etc. With the different data that we provide, you can also use them to enhance your engagement strategy. It will help you to have factual scientific data to be able to have your different, I will say, a debate or arguments uh, to improve the strategy of the different company for which you have an engagement strategy. Then five, what you will have is the alignment with the European taxonomy and the share of fossil energy. So here it's quite explicit. Sustainable is in the sense of the European taxonomy uh, sustainable. And also for fossil fuel, I think it's quite explicit. Then you will have the alignment with the Paris Agreement. No one will come back about this specific uh, topic, but here what is expected is setting quantitative targets and associated methodological detail. In particular, investors must set a quantitative target for 2030 and every five years thereafter until 2015, including all greenhouse gas emission and explicitly it's with a temperature rise, so that is very important. And we'll explain to you how we do it with CI methodology. In terms of green gas emission, coming back to my point about the bottom-up methodology, it's very important to have um, a remodelization of the scope three, because if you only look at what is reported, you will minimize what you will report, and hence you might have an issue about uh, green machine acquisition as well. So then when we look at the seven uh, parts, biodiversity alignment, here what is expected is the publication of strategy for alignment with international biodiversity conservation targets with quantitative objective and associated methodological detail. So as you can see, it's a lot of time required that you explicit the different type of method and data. And as a data and methodology provider, within our uh, offer, we directly provide you um, text, uh, reports, analysis to be able to republish and explain to the regulator which kind of methodology you have used. Then you will have everything about uh, risk management and specificity of climate risk and biodiversity. So here, everything you will have is general process of identification, assessment, prioritization, management um, of associated risk. Uh, for physical and transitional risk uh, linked to climate and biodiversity. So this is the different expectation that you will have on Article 29. So if we go now on the next slide to, uh, to see uh, what is at stake, why the government is asking you to report this different kinds of metric. The first point is that it's a joint effort. As you can see, everything has begun a lot of years ago and they had not asked uh, in 2023, everything at once, but it's really a journey in terms of transparency, but they also understand the fact that the methodology are developing and that you are dependent of what exists in the market. And it's why you have to comply or explain. That being said, if different actors are able to comply, you are also expect to comply as well if it is feasible within the market. Then you have the part about st steering the transition. It's very important in France, as you know, we have the um, SGPE, so the General Secretary about ecological planification. And hence, if at the state level, we want to have this planification about objective and Paris alignment, we need to know where stands the financial sector. And hence, the publication of your strategy with your target is a very important for the regulator, but also for the government to see where do we stand in terms of Paris Agreement and where do we stand in terms of the Montreal uh, Agreement as well. And last but not least, we can see that Paris has all been, always been perceived in terms of competence, in terms of ambition as a green financial center. And it's a way to continue to demonstrate France leadership in sustainable finance. And it's very important in terms of credibility of our different initiatives. And to conclude on this part, maybe one example of what we have seen in terms of leadership and influence, if we look at the TNFD approach um, with the LIB approach, so the locate, evaluate, assess, and prepare. So everything which is for the corporate, but also now for the financial actor. 
we can see that France has been very innovative because all actors that has been used for Article 29 to publish on biodiversity already have the different metric for evaluate and assess um, since the Article 29. And if we look at the different uh, documents of TNFZ, Article 29 is quoted as an example of um, a good transparency measure which lead and led the way uh, worldwide with the TNFZ. So that concludes the first part about the introduction, but now we will see in more detail with Nolwen directly how you can answer it, which kind of metric you can use, and how we can help you in this journey of transparency. Thank you very much, Melissa. I will take uh, the following slides. So yes, regarding the offer uh, of Carbon Cap for Finance, first, um, before entering into more details, what we provide is three different things. So the first thing is the data. So to be able to report what is required from you in the Article 29, you will need some data, some indicators regarding the different aspects Melissa mentioned, so climate, biodiversity, and also physical risk. So data is the basis of what is required. But we do not offer only data. Uh, because to help you reporting this data, formulating conclusion, aggregate the data at portfolio level, compare with benchmarks, et cetera, you'll need analysis. So we provide on top of the data analysis on your portfolio with some conclusions, some explanation from analysts um, to compare the results, et cetera. So this is the second um, layer, let's say. Then that is not enough. Maybe you will have some questions, you don't understand the results, etc. So the third layer we provide is a training and support to be able to help you understand the result of your portfolio, the comparison with the benchmark, the result of uh, what is in line or not with what is required by the Article 29. So overall, you will have the data, to um, different indicators at line by line data out of each line regarding your portfolio. Then you will have aggregated results with analysis, explanation, written formulation, etc. Then you can have some dedicated uh, support from our analyst team who can help you answering some question if you had. So our offer from Article 29 is the sum up of these three aspects. Now we will deep dive a bit more about the different indicators and how they can help you answering Article 29. Here is just a summary of what Melissa just presented earlier regarding the three databases. So CIA is for physical is for transition risk, CRIS is for physical risk, and BIA GPS is for biodiversity risk and dependencies. Here. Maybe it's a, a bit um, something that you have already um, uh, in in mind because Melissa has explained a bit more what is required for each paragraph of the law. You can see here that there are uh, five um, paragraphs that are required by the entity itself. And then uh, I will present you paragraph fifth sixth, seventh, and eighth to present you what we provide at Cabo for Finance to help you answering this specific paragraph inside the Article 29 law. And for each paragraph, you will have um, explanation of why these indicators provided by Cabo for Finance is very in line with what is required by the government and the Article 29. So here, the first uh, paragraph is paragraph fifth regarding the taxonomy, the European taxonomy. Um, at Carbon for Finance and in the CIA database, so for transition risk, we do have some taxonomy indicators regarding the alignment of your portfolio and of companies regarding the taxonomy, etc. We provide the green share, the eligible green share, the brown share, which is a share of the exposure of coal 
uh, for all the activities in which your company invo involved in. So for example, the exploration of coal, also the manufacturing of equipment for coal, the power production uh, coming from coal, etc. This is the brown share. And then we have the fossil share, which includes of all of fossil fuel. Uh, so for example, the coal, but also oil and gas. So to sum up, we have four indicators that can help you answering this uh, paragraph, the fifth paragraph regarding European taxonomy. Then if we go to the sixth paragraph, regarding now the alignment with a Paris alignment, um, we do have a metric in CIA called temperature alignment of portfolio. That is exactly what is required from Article 29. And to explain you a bit more these indicators here. So the result, the final result is the temperature. So an alignment of your portfolio regarding the Paris alignment um, agreement to tell you if your portfolio is currently compatible or not with what is required from it. Um, to compute this indicator at portfolio level, the temperature on the right of the slide here, we will need to evaluate the contribution of each underlying component of your portfolio. And to do that, we use the CIA overrating, which is a ranking ranging from A plus to E minus, and which tells you if the company is contributing positively or negatively to the transition. So it's a measure of the carbon transition of the company itself. We compute these indicators for each company, each underlying component, and then we aggregate that to compute a temperature at portfolio level, which can be compared with some benchmark, reference and benchmark, or compared over time. And now we will see a bit more how is composed um, the CIA overrating and how do we calculate temperature? So regarding the CIA overwriting, which is the core indicator of the CIA methodology, you can see here three main components uh, that are um, including in the CIA overwriting. The first component is the past performance. So to compute this indicator, we look at the past performance of the company we look at uh, five years ago, where it standed, and now where it ended, we look at the reduction or evolution of the past performance of the company, which gives us a, a look at how is the past dynamic. Then the second indicator is the current performance. Here is in, it's important to look at the photography of the performance currently uh, for the company. So we compare the intensity of the company regarding its peers, its sectoral peers, and we look if the company is below its peers or higher or better of, uh, than his peers. So past performance, current performance, and then it's not enough to attribute the contribution of the company to look only at the past and the present. We need to look um, at the future because if the company does not, does not uh, do anything to increase or decrease its uh, carbon footprint, it's not a uh, very holistic overview. So that's why we have a third pillar, which is the future performance. And to compute this indicator, we look at different criteria. So here you will have um, the overall strategy of the company. We look at... Um, how is uh, integrated into its strategy, the climate change uh, issues, etc. Then the second sub criteria, let's say, is the weight of investment towards a low carbon economy and toward um, carbon transition. So we look at um, innovation, capex, etc. And we compare these investments regarding sectoral scenarios to be able to understand if the company is on the right pathway or not regarding investments. That was for the second sub criteria. Then 
we look also at the reduction targets for scope one and two, so direct emissions, but also for scope three emissions, indirect from upstream and downstream emissions. So here for targets, depending on different sectors, you will need maybe for a company to reduce mostly its scope one and two emissions because that is uh, the main material impact or maybe at the scope one and two emissions, but also at scope three emissions, it depends on sectors. And to compute and to be able to attribute, attribute a score for each company, we compare the reduction target of the companies with some sectoral scenarios and some two degree scenario. And we compare what is the gap between what is expected from the company uh, within its sector and what is the company um, expecting to do. Then we also look at a third aspect in the future performance, which is called governance. We look at the governance regarding climate change issues. Uh, we look, for example, if um, there is um, training for the employees of the company regarding climate change issues. We look at also the incentives for um, the goals regarding carbon reduction, environmental goals, etc., And we look at the involvement of the term management within the, um, the company. So overall, to sum up here, we have a CIS sectoral rating for each activity of the company. So if the company is involved in more than one activity, we do look at each of its activity to compute a CIA overall score for each of its activity. Then naturally the CIA overall rating at company level is a weighted average of each CIA sectoral rating for each activity, weighted by the share of revenues coming from this activity. So this was for the CIA overrating, which is a measurement of the contribution of a company toward the transition, and which is the base for us to be able, able to compute the temperature, which is required by the sixth uh, paragraph of Article 29. Then, if you uh, remember here, to go from CIA overall rating to the temperature of portfolio, we have um, a model a formula that can translate the CIA overall rating at the portfolio level, which is here on the graph represented here from A plus to one to E minus to 15 here. It's the portfolio overall rating. So the weighted average of each Overall rating at company level, at it, which is at portfolio level. And then we are able to translate this rating into a temperature thanks to this formula. So this formula was built with four different points. Two of the points are the limits. So the lowest temperature and the highest temperature, which are given by the IPCC reports. So we have the limits, um, the lowest and highest. Then we have built the, 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 the curve here in the middle is built with two different uh, data points. So the first one is uh, temperature, in, um, temperature of 3.5 degrees, which represents a business as usual economy. If we do not do anything, we know that the economy um, the actual economy will lead to an increase of 3.5 3 um, degrees uh, higher. So to model this business as usual economy, we use uh, index, uh, the large uh, cap index, MSCI World, for example, to, stay, to say, okay, this index, we calculate, we do know how to calculate the all, portfolio overrating of this index. And we say this index, this overrating, which is around 8.5, correspond to 3.5 degrees. This is a first point. Then the second one is to modeling um, the two degree scenario. We do not know 
how uh, to compute exactly now uh, what would like what would um, uh, like a, a two degree world, but we are able to imagine what can it be like. So to modeling this two degree point, we use the LC100, which represents the 100 companies, European companies, which have the lowest impact in regarding climate change. So that are the two main points. And with our limits, we are able to compute a formula which can give for any portfolio, any index, any fund, the correspondence between the overwriting, the CIA overwriting, and the temperature. So that was for what is required from Article 29 to the sixth paragraph. Now we will see a bit more on the biodiversity aspects for the seventh paragraph and then the eighth paragraph. So to be able to answer these requirements from Article 29, we will use an, um, our second database, which is Biodiversity Impact Analytics, so BIA TBS. So the first thing which is required in the seventh paragraph is the biodiversity alignment. So that is very uh, difficult to provide because here, um, as maybe you can you know, um, there is not a consensus regarding the targets for biodiversity. It's not as simple as it is in the climate aspects because um, it's not a, very, um, a subject which has been taken for a long time. So. Basically, um, on the last convention on biodiversity and biological diversity, there have been four objectives that had been set. And here, what we provide in the context of Article 29 is a first suggestion to be able to compute alignment with biodiversity objectives. And we use a conversion method. So to sum up and to, uh, to summarize a bit, the target can be um, defined for each sector regarding what was set on the Convention on Biological Diversity. We have for each sector targets in terms of intensity, that is the postulate. Then for each company and also at portfolio level, we are able to, trans to translate uh, these targets into reduction in impact intensities in terms of MSA uh, kilo, square kilometers per euro of sales. We will look um, a bit further what is MSA uh, per square kilometers. So for each company, we are able to know what is required for this company to be able to match this target. Company whose uh, intensities are greater than these targets are not aligned, but company that um, whose intensities are below these targets are considered as aligned with um, this convergence method. And this approach can give us a um, percentage of the portfolio which is aligned with the biodiversity aspects. So this figure is um, in the percentage and can be compared with a benchmark or can be compared over time. But what is it's important to have in mind is that is um, a first step towards measuring the alignment of company, but it's not very easy to compute this kind of indicators. That was for the alignment score. Now, what is also required in the seventh paragraph is the measurement of portfolio, but footprints by compartments. So here, um, a bit of an example regarding the um, alignment and the MSA square kilometers. So if you will look at the right side of the slide here, it's an example, but it can be helpful for you to understand. We have first a uh, pristine forest. So pristine forest, we can suppose that all ecosystem are here and in the right proportion, we have an MSA of 100%. Then if you look at the bottom here, we have a plantation. In the plantation, there is maybe not all, every ecosystem biodiversity, biodiversity 
city species, etc. So the MSA is not 100%, is uh, 30% here. And now let's do a bit of the math. If we um, uh, go from 100 to 30% is a reduction of 70% of uh, MSA. And we will need to compute, to calculate, to multiply this 70% of MSA loss by the surface of the area considered. So here, let's say it's a, around 100 square kilometers. So here, this conversion causes the loss of 70 MSA square kilometers because we multiply the, square, the MSA in percentage by the area is square kilometer. So to sum up, one MSA square kilometers loss is correspond to the artificialization of one square kilometer in terms of area of a pristine natural ecosystem. So an uh, ecosystem that was at uh, MSA of 100%. The MSA square kilometer is a key metric for the biodiversity database. So we use it to compute and to be able to measure the biodiversity footprint. And we can divide that by compartment. So um, it depends on the aquatic or terrestrial, and it depends also of static and dynamic way to compute and to measure this footprint. In the um, article 29, you will have access to all this data and all these details by compartment to be able to understand um, where are really the highest impact in terms of biodiversity. Then here, um, the article 29 also requires for you to be um, able to report the impact of biodiversity by pressures. So here you can see the IPBUS pressures on the left side. We do cover the four main pressures, the, the, the four, um, first uh, pressure here. And we are using another classification in the um, GBS. So it's a Clobio pressures because in the model, um, the GBS, we use uh, Globio to compute um, impact, etc. So it's not the same classification, but in the article 29, you are able to be um, to make the correspondence between the IPBAS pressures and the GBS pressures. So that uh, was for the seventh paragraph on biodiversity element. We have seen that we provide an alignment in terms of percentage for the portfolio. Um, and we provide also the footprints and the impact in terms of MSA square kilometers. Now in the next paragraph, so the eighth, we will see how we can provide and help you um, provide some indicators regarding the risk management for biodiversity, but also for climate data. So for this, we, on the biodiversity aspects first, we need to look at not only the impact of your companies and of your portfolio on biodiversity, but also look at the double materiality of the dependencies of your portfolio and the companies to biodiversity services. So here we provide uh, dependencies um, we have a full database with dependency scores, etc., on the ecosystem services that are given by the biodiversity. And for each sectors of a company, we are able to, to say, okay, this sector um, is very dependent of this ecosystem, this sector a bit less, etc. And that is given at the company level, but also at the portfolio level. And we do have two different scores regarding dependencies and average dependencies, but the average doesn't tell you what is really at stake because it's an average. So you don't know if it's uh, just an average on all each ecosystem services or if there is one ecosystem services or one sector which is very high and the other very low. So the average is 
average. So to, to, um, to provide this information, we have added another type of dependency score, which is the critical dependency score, which is um, a complementary to the average dependency score, and which tells you, okay, where are very the highest dependency in terms of service uh, ecosystem services and to in terms of sectors. That was for the dependency regarding biodiversity to answer eight the paragraph eight of the regulation. But um, as Melissa explained earlier, you do have to uh, also report regarding the specificity of climate risks and risk management um, regarding these specific issues. So here we also have a third database called CRIS, so the Climate Risk Impact Screening which um, is able to compute for each company and each underlying component of your portfolio, the exposure of physical climate risk. This data database called CRIS um, has um, a very uh, complete approach because we based our analysis on geographical and sectoral information. So we compute some geographical distribution of the company with the sectoral distribution. And we map these two indicators to know if there is an activity in such geographical, um, such country in this sector. Okay, what is my risk in terms of physical uh, hazard? Which is the second point here. So what is a hazard? We look at different hazards such as the increase in terms of average temperature, but also in terms of uh, heavy rainfalls, um, heat waves, etc. So we have different hazards, and for each of these hazards, we are able to assess a score for the company and then for the portfolio to tell if the company is at risk or not regarding this specific physical risk. We use three different scenarios to be able to have a bit of um, resilience and um, a critical overview of the scenarios, depending on the average of temperature. And we have two time horizon. So we compute uh, for um, 2050 and uh, for uh, 2100 to be able to, to understand and to know if the portfolio is more at risk uh, at what time horizon um, to, to be able to have a, a very holistic view regarding the different scenarios, because we do not know now what will be the very correct higher um, increase of temperature, but also for time horizon. That is um, all the indicators or an extract of the different indicators we are able to provide in terms of Article 29 to help you answering the different paragraphs, the different things that are required by the Article 29. And to just add one or two um, more um, indicators for you to be um, fully, uh, let's say, um, to explain you fully what is including in, in this offer. So the first part was the data, if you remember. So the data includes each indicator we have reviewed now for each company within your portfolio, but also at portfolio level, the data. Then we also provide some conclusion analysis, et cetera, on the results from the data. So to do that, we are able to use a comparison with a benchmark which is your choice. You chose the benchmark, which is the most relevant for your portfolio. And we compare each of the relevant indicators to the benchmark to tell you, okay, um, the these figures, these results is um, what is required by Article 29, but we do not know if it's good, bad, what is the, the room for improvement, etc. So to do that, we compare with a benchmark. And here you have an example of what can be provided for the climate aspect 
regarding the induced emissions and emission savings. So in the CIM methodology, we come back a bit earlier, um, we do provide so induced emissions, emission savings, <clears throat> and to be able to compare these two metrics that cannot be added, we do the ratio between them. So this ratio is called the carbon impact ratio. Um, so that is what is uh, given in the bottom of the slide here, the SEER. And we compare what um, is the SEER of the portfolio compared to the benchmark. And here you can see, if we look at the figure, that the portfolio has, has very much higher emissions than the benchmark. You can see in the, the, the dark blue uh, induced emissions in the graph, but the portfolio has also higher emission savings than the benchmark. So overall, if we do the ratio between these two indicators, so emission savings by induced emissions, we can see that the ratio is far much higher for the portfolio than for the benchmark, because you have a ratio of uh, 0 0.29 for the portfolio and 0 0.10 for the benchmark. So this is good. It means that even if the portfolio has much higher induced emissions than the benchmark, it also has much higher emission savings. So the companies inside the portfolio are more in line or contribute more and better to the transition than the benchmark. So that was just an example of what, what we can provide a comparison, the data, the comparison with the benchmark with some explanations in the right slide of uh, the, the slide. And if this is not enough for you to understand, we are um, available to answer any question you may have with uh, um, some hours of analysts, which are included also in the offer. And to sum it here, um, regarding the offer, uh, to um, answer some practical details. Oh, I don't know why I can't. Okay. Okay, so um, maybe there is no more slides. No, okay. Um, I don't know if Melissa, you want to to say a few words um, by mean of conclusion? Yes, so um, as we have explained to you, the <laughs> so to conclude, just uh, as a reminder, we'll share the different slides and the replay will be available. Uh, we shall review the different expectation of Article 29 and how in very uh, in real life we can help you to uh, answer it to give you uh, roughly an idea um, when we help actors for the full Article 29. The number of slides, I think it's uh, 100 slides because we provide all of the results for the different benchmark, for the different portfolio, and the different explanation for each one of the metric and how is it linked uh, directly to the requirements of Article 29. So we'll send to you everything. If you need anything, don't hesitate to contact us directly uh, via the website or via our address uh, email address. Uh, globally, if you need um, the offer of Article 29, we can, in maximum four weeks, provide you the, the, full, um, the full offer with the reporting, the analysis, the explanation, uh, and the answer to your different uh, questions you might have on the results. So really don't hesitate uh, if you need anything on climate and or on biodiversity.